Yo, welcome to Frex Knows Best. It's time to ingest a man. I keep saying this, I've got a special guest, and everyone what comes on my podcast is a special guest, yeah? But this one, <laughs> we have history. The definition, if you look in the dictionary of history, is us two, because we've gone through it from day dot. I would like you like to introduce you, my good friend, Rayanne. How are you doing? Hey, got a little bit of imposter syndrome today, to be honest. Nothing special about me. I'm just the same as everyone else. But honoured to be here. Happy yes. to see you doing your thing and be part of it. So yeah, yeah, look, thank you. Honestly, I really appreciate this. This is like the I'm at the beginning of doing this podcast, and uh, I'm getting quite comfortable now of just chatting. Like I know I'm comfortable in the in the real world of chatting, but this podcast thing, I'm getting quite comfortable with this. But um. Yeah, this, as we know with this podcast, it's all about not just me, just a little bit of me. It's all about you. And obviously, we've got so much history and all of this stuff. So first of all, like in general, life and all that, like you just said, not much is happening. But I know because we, we used to be so close. We used to live in the same era for everyone who's listening, right? But yeah, just like life, as we get older, reality is everyone goes their paths you know yep. but the main thing especially through everything and I remember through COVID as well me and you were connecting <laughs> with those lives yep. you know what I mean which was great yep. and we still managed to maintain this communication so um let me give you a bit of background with Rayanne so um me and Rayanne um we met um actually when did we meet can you remember the first time you know what I mean we met and then we worked out what our connections were now we're going Way back, back into time, 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 time. Well, I think you've you've probably got a memory. Yeah. I, it pains me to say this, mm -hmm. I can't actually pinpoint the very first time that we met, mm -hmm. but our grandparents knew yes. each other from way way back they mm -hmm. knew each other back in Barbados they stayed in touch and stayed really close friends when they moved over here like in mm -hmm. the sort of late 60s early 70s whenever it was um and I remember being at my grandparents house like I used to go there every Thursday for dinner with my mum which was just the best mm -hmm. and my grandmother used to say she was like oh you know, Nita's got a grandson that goes to your music school. He's called Ruben. He plays a saxophone, blah, blah, blah. So on Saturday mornings when I used to go to music school, I'd quite often be in two different orchestras. So I'd do like one half of the morning in one orchestra and then in the break time go over to the other orchestra. So, and the corridors always used to be busy, full of people with all their little instruments on their back, and I'd be looking, 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 like, where's this Ruben guy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever told you this, but for months, and I mean months, yeah, I saw some other guy that I just assumed was you, and I'd just be like waving, what? huh? What? <laughs> <laughs> Went to speak to him one day, and he was like, I'm not Ruben. Ruben's in <laughs> like, that band. Like, I was like, oh, my God. I was mortified. But yeah. I I gen, genuinely can't pinpoint look, the first I'm, time look, that we I'm met. I'm with you. I'm with you because <laughs> I kind of threw you under the bus there because I was trying to remember it on the way when I was just driving up today, coming back home. And uh, I was trying to remember, like, because yeah. we've done so much, I thought, what was the first meeting? I knew it was music school. And then we kind of yeah. we kind of found out there's connections and all that. But, um, yeah, but I definitely know it was music school. I remember how how fresh we look man i'm showing mum a picture of me and you in prague right and i was oh wearing some joke God. jacket and we're there man and i'm looking at us man thinking we are fresh do you know what i mean compared to what was going to happen to us we look fresh <laughs> do you know what you know what we've been through mm -hmm. we still look a lot fresher than we could do you know what I mean? What I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump ahead here because I know Ray, I met up with Ray recently. We went and saw Andy C. Um, and she brought her 15-year-old son with her to the... No, he's, first... he's just only turned 13. 13, only just sorry. Turned 13, 13 yeah, sorry, so my bad. He was actually 12. 
Yeah. Which is nuts. And, and one thing I, I, I know, I'm just mind blown. Like that for me was just such an amazing, if I was a parent and I'm taking my, my youth to go see Andy C, I'll just feel so completed, especially with the journey we've been on with that guy. And uh, one yeah. one comment I always remember is you say like Rubes, you used to look alright, but well, go on. <laughs> everybody else has definitely grown up. <laughs> Everyone else has definitely changed. And one thing we, me and you, have yeah. definitely maintained is like literally we still yeah. look half yeah. half decent. You know, we've held on to that heart. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Some brothers yeah. have just let it go, man. You know what I mean? They probably yeah. got into that family life. Been for now. But, times. <laughs> but for my audience, right? For my audience, so we've mentioned music school, so they know. If, they, if you don't know what I play by now, come off the channel, yeah? And you deserve but, to block. Yeah, block up, yeah? But, Ray, would you like to tell them yeah. the instrument you play? Well, mm -hmm. um, it's funny because I kind of, I dabbled in a couple of other little things along the way as well. Mm -hmm. I think everybody played recorder at some point. Mm -hmm. I played the clarinet alongside my main instrument for a while. Tried the okay. flute for a little bit. Right. Okay. I was just one of those kids that just wanted to try everything. Mm -hmm. But when I was first starting in music, I was desperate to play the piano. Right. Went on and on and on and on at my mum about wanting to play the piano. Mm. And she it was around the sort of time, you know, sort of mid to late eighties. You remember mm. when the Casio keyboards were Yeah, like, them all keyboards were jokes. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm gonna go to learn <laughs> Yes. Mm -hmm. And my mum kind of put the blockers on that. She's like, we haven't got space in our house. But I tell you what, we'll go to go to the music shop. I think it was called Hammond's. It's Hammond's, a little music okay. shop in Watford. Watford, yeah. Yeah, which used to be kind of down like in the back of Watford town mm -hmm. somewhere. And um, she was like, let's go into the music shop and see if anything else kind of catches your eye. Mm -hmm. So it was literally just by chance looking around just looking on the shelves mm -hmm. and I just went mm, that and and it was a violin and right okay yeah and my mum was like oh god because you yeah, know yeah, yeah. what most kids sound like when they first start playing the violin mm -hmm. but she supportive as ever she was like okay fine we'll try it and it was a little half size violin mm -hmm. one of the cheap kind of little Chinese ones that everyone yeah. starts out on. It's like yeah, bright yeah. orange, like nothing Rah. special. Okay. I think it cost, I think it cost like £30 at the time okay. to buy right. it, Go on. which yeah. tells me the sort of quality that it was. It wasn't great. Mm. And she found me a violin teacher and he was just like straight, like from my first lesson, he was like, she's, mm. she's a natural at this instrument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like nobody starts out and just gets it like that yeah, yeah, so yeah. Yeah, was man very, very lucky so pretty straight because it's funny yeah. because um yeah obviously big up to the mums because my mum was a big part of me playing the saxophone I basically went I got offered the violin cello all of them ones I was like yeah yeah I just kept my eye because I had a toy saxophone. So I was. Like, yeah, but way, look, I know. I got all, influence. I know what all you wind players think about string players. That we're the geeks and we're this and we're that. <laughs> Listen, right? I didn't even want to go there. Yeah, but I don't know what I knew. What was cool? I got to be honest. I didn't know what was cool. All I know is that I was influenced at a young age because I had a toy saxophone. So that must have been in. In um, implanted in my brain, yeah, I had this like silver one. Yeah. Um, and so I was probably thinking, yeah, I want the real thing, but also I, I like the sound of it as well. But I also one of those, and I probably was at a young age. I didn't like to follow the main, the main crowd, or like follow what everybody else is doing. I thought, right, well, let me do something a little bit different. Let me find something that, uh, some something which is not everyone's doing. And um, yeah, I found the yeah. sax. And so yeah, big up to the the mums for that. Now. At the beginning, because you had the same as me, like we both picked it up naturally. And um, um, when you were practicing and when you got through all of that, were you really focused on just kind of getting all the grades done, uh, early age to kind of concentrate on your um, schoolwork? Because I know that was my mum's main mission for me, was to kind of get it all done before my GCSE. So done my grade eight by, the, by 14. Um, how was the whole process with you with learning the, the violin? Well, as I said, my teacher kind of clocked quite early on that I was 
a natural. So I didn't do all of my grades. I skipped mm-hmm. quite a few. And I probably, this sounds nuts looking back on it now, mm. but I probably could have done my grade eight by the age right. of about 11. <laughs> but but I, I didn't pass my grade five theory until my third attempt. Okay. And I think you had to have your grade five theory yes, you before yeah. you could do grade eight. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I was, oh, I was fuming. I don't know what it was. Like something mm. just didn't click for me with the theory side of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, as soon as I got that, I was like, right, grade yeah, eight, yeah. here we come. I did my mm-hmm. grade eight in the end. I was mm-hmm. 13, I think. Still, look at that, man. I think for everyone to understand, it was, because people get shocked when I mention like I've done my grade eight at 14, but it's not uncommon at all. Yeah. One bit at all, because... uh it was uh, a lot of parents was quite smart. It's like we put a lot of work into that and they wanted us to kind of get that done and concentrate on the schoolwork. So I know for anyone who's listening, that was like the, it kind of made sense back then. I know things are probably different now because there's this thing called the internet. Imagine us having the internet while learning our instruments. I mean, yeah. I look at some of the students I teach now and I'm jealous that they have this thing called the internet where they can, without the teacher, they could just jump along and play along to anything yeah. they want, you know, which is amazing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, big. I mean, yeah, big up to technology, and I wish I had it at that age because I know I would have advanced with the way my brain was. I would have advanced so much more further with the with the internet. Um, yeah, but yeah, this kind of so- nicely we touched with it, right? Because this links onto music school. Would you like to give your uh, your vibe of what you thought of your experience was at music school? At music school, yeah. How did oh. you find music school for yourself? I I loved it. Loved, nah. loved, 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 loved. I mean, if I hadn't gone to music school, yep. you and I probably wouldn't have even met. We yep. wouldn't be friends. Yep. Like, I don't know if you remember when you came um, came to my wedding, like my mm-hmm. granddad made a speech and he actually referenced, he was like, he made a point of mentioning music school in his speech right. because he could right. see people dotted around the room that I'd, like made friends with three music. Mm-hmm. Um, I loved it. I'm so glad I did it. I started playing in orchestras, probably same sort of age as you do. I think I started music school when I was about eight. Yeah, I started about nine. Yeah, I was a little. Yeah. I call that a late bloomer, but yeah, nine. So yeah, little Academy Strings was the first orchestra. Mm-hmm. Everyone sitting there. <laughs> that sound at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Everyone like moving uh, the violins rather yeah. than the violin. Yeah, so yeah. Um, it was a real life changing experience. Yeah, I agree. Because I think playing as a soloist is very different to playing mm-hmm. in an orchestra. I mean, you still get to show off a little bit yeah, in an yeah. orchestra. Um, but it's a real kind of collective and it's almost like a family. Yeah. Really, that, yeah. that was my experience of it. Yeah. Yep. And obviously, like, I think you kind of progress through the different stages with a yeah. lot of the same people. Obviously, yeah. other people come in and drop out along the way. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I kind of moved through my music school experience with the same little group, yeah. which was... No, I yeah. second that. I mean, I think it was... Um... For myself, it was like a game changer. It was something where I found I found I belonged somewhere. I mean, at school, I had these different pockets of friends. I was like one of those I could float around from different group to group or whatever. But yes, I didn't really yeah. find something that I f- found something that I had a real connection with, like uh, to share with yeah. some someone. And went to music school, and I was like, oh, I found it. I mean, the characters we had in that place. Some of our good friends, which are yeah. still good friends now, we've got yeah, our friends and Haggis and Gavin, and they'll be listening to this now because I know Haggis watches <laughs> uh, watches these podcasts. <laughs> so big shout out to you, bro, because I know you'll be listening. <laughs> and look who I got! I told you she's coming on here, man. I told you. Um, but yeah, we got we met so many good friends, and uh, we've had so many great memories and stories of, especially what I, I mentioned in the previous podcast was um, you get to the top band and then you go on tour right and um tour was the biggest bonding experience for everyone because uh we i learned from haggis and gavin how to drink 
alcohol. You know, that's what I learned. <laughs> I, I thought I knew how to drink alcohol to, yeah. whole, till I met them. So, uh, yeah. I mean, what's your best memory, would you say, of like all the tours? You How many tours did you go on, by the way? <clears throat> um, I think I did, I think I did four or five. Okay, go on. I've done, I only done three. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I did four or five. But, um, yeah, eye opening because as you say, Big time. you think you know, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then you realize you don't but, know. Like, think about the words we come out with, innit? Lagboat, lagboat got born. <laughs> lagboat, <laughs> and for people who wants to know what a lagboat is, it's someone like a lash head, yeah, you can't handle their juice, and they're all all over the place, yeah. We came with that word, lagboat, and me and Ray, it's one of those oh, words. You, like... you, you <laughs> Listen. I didn't want to take that one, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to take that one at all. But Lagbo, I, yeah, you, I can even remember when you came up with it. It was Venice Tour, 1998. And we were on the coach. And I made sure that I was on the same coach as you. Smart move. And it was your, as we were um, driving to Venice, mm -hmm. it was your 16th birthday. <laughs> you went from the front of the coach I hope I'm not baiting you up here you went from the front of the coach to mm -hmm. the back of the coach mm -hmm. and you said I'm going to get a kiss from every girl on this bus for my listen birthday. I want to explain <laughs> I want to explain right I was 16 right and we know what 16 year old boys are like yeah they're just like experimenting with the world right and I'm just I like to experiment maybe I should have become a scientist but that it was a great experiment because uh, it, it worked. I, I, I pretty much tried to get everyone and, and I used my birthday <laughs> as a vantage as well. Do you know to what? And fair play to you because these days it probably wouldn't work. But back then all the girls were like, oh. Look, look, I've got to say, right, there was, a, there was a thing about for plats back then, yeah? I had the plats then, yeah? Because there was that group called Emanate and there's a guy with plats there, right? Right? <laughs> Right, so that kind of gave me a little, a little, little advantage, you know, like you know what I mean, which I didn't take advantage, but I just used to my advantage, you know what I mean. But um, yeah, man, I look back no. at that, man, like that was just a crazy time. Yeah, I've I said to someone um earlier, was that earlier on today or yesterday? Mm. You're just one of those people, like you could probably get away with so much. Because people are just naturally drawn to you, like you're an attractive guy, you're kind of physically striking, naturally funny and cool, and you can dance, and you've just got this kind of energy about you that everyone, like, I've been to raves with you, mm -hmm. clubs, yeah, whatever, yeah. Mm -hmm. and for anyone who doesn't know Ruben that's watching, like, mm -hmm. you can walk into a room with this guy and everyone just goes, Vroom, <laughs> on the spot. <laughs> Right. Listen, I remember, listen. Like, I'm people who didn't know you before. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, my friend Ruben, you're going to love him. He's so cool. They're like, oh, yeah, whatever. Like, what's so special about <laughs> And then they meet you and they're like, oh, my God. Listen, look, listen, listeners, listen to me, right? So He's imagine like, what? okay, you believe what she's saying, right? Because, yeah, it's pretty much 99% true. But... Right. <laughs> Listen, but when me and Rayanne were together. Not so, together together, by the way. Not together just, like that. But I mean, you know, you just put both our energies into a whether it be the same environment, a club, rave, whatever. It's dangerous for anyone because everyone's gonna think like, who are these two? Are they like cousins, brothers, these sisters. Two the way they go on, like they, they're dancing, they're doing the same moves, they're always laughing, they're always skin and teeth, they can't <laughs> stop catching jokes. And everyone's probably curious with this energy, like what is the connection with these two? And I think that was the, that was like the core of us because I think of all the times me, and I look at all the times we share together, I don't think there's not one time that we haven't been cracking up and catching yeah. jokes. Do you know what I mean? Like literally in stitches, like there's no one else would kind of, kind of gets that kind of same humor and you meet look i have a lot of friends but there's that humor there's that little bit of humor that only certain heads get and we got a certain different kind of language that we only us 
can we could trigger each off we could trigger yeah. each other off with our with saying these certain words and um yeah. yeah that's kind of bond for everyone to know that's the kind of bond me and ray had um and it kind of built up all through music school like like we were just saying about um tours because there was obviously us as a core we had our group but obviously this tour was massive there was like three coach loads of us which used to travel on there and it's like a 24 hour pretty much yeah it's a 24 hour trip wasn't it just to get to wherever we prove yeah. or venice or whatever it, yeah, yeah. you kind of drive through like three countries on the way yeah, yeah, the, yeah. I mean, the coach journeys in in themselves were part of the whole experience that was just, it i think that was the whole part this. big part of it you know yeah and when you look back it was i mean like here's there was stuff which i got introduced to like the boys at the back like for everyone to know like to get to the back means you're a cool kid, right? So me and my friend Ben, like um he was a trumpet player, which I grew up in the same school and we done everything together, right? And uh me and him always tried to get to the back of the coach. We always tried to get to the back. And we finally get moved to the back of the coach, right? And the boys are like, because it's a 24 hour trip, they will always say, Right, time to bring out the talc. And you're like, What's this, what's this talc, right? Nad talc. Like, nads. There's the things to stop your nads. Which anybody wants to know what a nads is, and I'm not talking about a, a short name for Nadja, right? I'm talking about your tings, man tings, yeah? They get sweaty when you've been on the coach sitting there, right? And the thing is to help the sweat, to calm down the sweat. They were teaching us how to tout the nads, you Ooh. know? So uh, literally, I mean, we learned all of this. We were young. We learned all of this. It was just yes. so much fun. Uh, and... Um, um, and, I mean, look, I always say with my mum, she always thought, oh, this music school, oh, we even have fun. Then, no, I learned everything I needed to know through music school, you know, yeah. <laughs> then being out there on the street. So, yes, yeah. that was good memories, man. That was good memories. And, um, yeah, yeah kind of nicely, because um, we, we shared all of that, and it kind of brings us on to uh, probably one of the most epic times of us in our little chapter, which was like mm-hmm. when we, or shall I say, you first because i want you to go there this look guys this is the queen i am ready to put everything down on this this is a queen of drum and bass yeah i say that off the chest right because i'll tell you for example right i'll be in a rave and the tune's just coming in like you might hear two little with the hi-hat and ray would tell me the name of the tune who wrote it she'll tell me everything she'll hear it before anyone else could hear it like this girl is the true fan of drum and bass and we all started i remember starting drum and bass raven probably about 16 17 just when you could just about look about hopefully you know when you used to get into the queue and you'd be sweating you you please let me in please let oh me my in God. <laughs> it starts shaking yeah exactly exactly you get to the front and you get love. the butterflies in the stomach you're like oh god this yeah. is it going to milton Keynes, hell or skelter um yeah we done, we done, like, we, we started off at that, that age. So, um, Ray, can you give, give us a little background of, like, do you remember your first, like, jungle? Because I'm going to start with the jungle. Like, what got you into this style of music? You thought, yeah, this is me. Oh, my goodness. Right, this is going to be a long answer, probably. Let's go. So, <clears throat> get comfortable, everybody. I'm um, I, I had two older stepbrothers growing up so one was eight years older than me and one was nine years older than me so obviously when I was still quite young they were out they used to do all the warehouse raves and illegal field raves you know where you get a message to your pager and then you'd have to like drive (laughs) mileage to go and find a rave and they used to come back and they'd have tape packs and stuff so I used to go into their rooms and basically nick their tapes (laughs) Um, so my I think one of my first jungle tapes that I got well I say got that I stole from them was a Dr. S. Gachet tape don't see him around that much anymore but I was just like what is this and then I think when I was about 13 or so Mm -hmm. it started started kind of creeping through a little bit into the mainstream right um and like tapes were getting released like having proper releases into the Mm -hmm. record shops and stuff Mm -hmm. so for my 13th birthday a couple of my mates bought me i think it was jungle jungle hits volume one or something like that it was a double tape pack 
And then that that was kind of it for me. But um, yeah, it's too young to go out raving. Yeah. It looked too young to go out raving. Mm-hmm. So even though I was still listening to Jungle and stuff at home, when I first started kind of sneaking into clubs and stuff, I was probably about 15. Mm-hmm. But I was going to Garage Raves in Watford. Yes. Because yeah. Garage, they, I don't know what it was about Watford, but all of the big names used to come in. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't so scared to go out in Watford because I knew if I didn't get in, then I only had like a 15 minute cab journey to get home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Easy. It's done a mission into London mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as a bop. So. I actually didn't have the confidence to start going out to drum and bass raves until I was like 18, which right. sounds kind of crazy. Mm. But I, oh God, what was my first? Like, yeah. My first... Because wasn't it, before you get to that bit, wasn't there, is, is there any tunes in Jungle which kind of ones you always remember, like, bang, they were like the ones which you thought, wow, I love Jungle. Because I grew up with uh, the obvious characters, you know, with, um, you had like, um, what would you call it? Uh, I remember coming into the mainstream because we were so young. You know, you had all the um, Sweet Love was massive. Yes. You know what I mean? That was like a massive one. Um, I remember that playing at the school discos and I was thinking, what is this style of music? And then you had uh, the music, um, the box, music television, you control, General Levy, Incredible. You know what I mean? You had all of these things which have made me feel like I love this style. So do you have any that you remember which are iconic ones and you thought, yeah, that, that's for me, like brings back memories. You just unlocked a call <laughs> about the box. That yeah. was a channel, like you had to call up, didn't you? And that like, was the one, yeah. You put your three digit like, numbers, yeah. <laughs> Man, do you know oh, how many parents God. complained about their phone bill because Jesus. of that? Yeah. And when like, we used to bunk off school, you're like, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you had to wait like an hour, or maybe two hours, just for your tune to come on because there's a queue. But yeah. I got a lot of, like, when that came on the cable, I got a lot of, um, like, kind of vibe with what's going on. Coming from the mainstream, but I didn't get the underground bit of yeah. what was going on until I went to an underground, like, Jungle Raven. I was like, whoa, this is kind of, this is kind of dark. You yeah. know what I mean? I was like, geez, this is kind of <laughs> moody. Like, I'm thinking, all right, I'm, I'm cool. But I'm thinking, I know other heads that won't be cool. Yes, they come down with me, like, geez, you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, do you, do you have any... Uh, certain tracks back then uh, that you can remember like I remember Chopper do you know what I mean that was massive when I was a, like a teenager for under underage raves do you know what I yeah. mean Amazon and all of that stuff <laughs> I said it yeah you said Watford and I said Amazon the two they go together like yin yang that's it <laughs> under 18 under 18 oh my god we've got so much yeah. to talk about I know <laughs> um my two well, I say two. There's obviously loads more, but two. Okay, maybe three mm-hmm. jungle tracks mm-hmm. that I still listen to really regularly to this day. That are just kind of like embedded into my core. Yeah, I think Dread Bass. <laughs> <laughs> just still when it's still. dropped. Oh, <laughs> oh my god! The bass line, even though it's like nearly 30 odd years old that track is just if you don't know it go and look it up it's just check it out I've literally my arms i've got goose pimples just thinking <laughs> um style by m beats okay um, yeah everyone kind of thinks of sweet love and yeah yeah, yeah. And that style is really special as well right and then one that's kind of a little bit later is just as like Jungle was probably just starting to starting to morph into mm-hmm. DB. Mm-hmm. Um, Roll on by Andy C. Yeah, Again, another one go. that's just oh yeah, yeah. He- you got the heads of my arm for that one. <laughs> <laughs> that one it's got me all kind of do 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 <laughs> in the intro like oh yeah just, yeah yeah. So it's probably those three yeah. would be like. Yeah, they're up there. Okay. Oh, and helicopter tune. Sorry, that's helicopter. Four. 100%. Look, yeah. I had a, because I grew up on the estate, and um, there was a guy who lived on the estate. His name was Terry, and he was, um, he was much older than me, but I remember him busting out this tune. You are becoming a wolf. 
<laughs> oh, the hairs are back. The hairs are back. Holy. Yeah, that's it. That, that was just ev- tick, 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 tick for me. Character. Do you know what I mean? When that, when that, and that just blew, because it was just like the whole bit at the beginning. Oh my God, man. I mean, that, like, hmm. I know we're saying we're old mm. and like we're still remembering all those old tunes, but mm. all those heads that made those tunes, they're still doing it now as well. Like man. I think that goes to show like just how special that music is. Like Massively. none of them really want mm. to retire. It's, you know, they're all in their like fifties and sixties. Because we're still going. That's they why got- they're not retired yeah. because we're still going. You still see yeah. the old school heads in the raves and you yeah. look at them like respect. Do you know what I mean? You still got it. Like, we still got it. How's the knees? The knees all good? Yeah, respect, bro. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. No, but a lot of those DJs, for anyone who knows, I think a lot of people will be listening to this. They know because it'll be a lot of my my age group, but um, or our age group. But yeah, like, I think with uh, uh, my mate Fran, we went to see Fabian Groove right there. And they're one of the biggest pioneers um, from at the beginning, especially with dance. Yeah. Yo, what up, Fran? You know, I know you're listening. Um, so yeah, I remember like going to see them, and they done like a like a live live orchestra of all their tracks, and it was it just brought and you saw the crowd there, and it just brought back so much nostalgia and memories from a lot yeah. of the tracks. And then they dropped um, uh, what was it UK Apache, Nanini World, and they done it as a live orchestra. Yeah, and it came on pretty much. I think it was close to the end. It was like the finale, unbelievable. Man, man. Everyone, was just... everyone was just crazy it was just and one of those where you still look at each other like yeah we still got it do you know what i mean yeah. we still got it the tune's still living now like how many years i remember that was in the 90s when that came out if i'm yeah. correct i think yeah. again that was the box that's the only time yeah. i knew about uk apache was because of the box uh, music television you control i was just like what's this yeah. used to keep coming on yeah that and, I, and... Be like when that came out that was <laughs> that must be like 95 96 something probably, like that yeah yeah, yeah definitely because yeah, yeah that's probably looking at my age then yeah i'm probably about 14 but um yeah so yeah man we've covered we've covered like a a lot of that era that transition that moment in time when we had garage we had we had the jungle then we had garage and then the drum and bass started to come back in right mm-hmm. and when this drum and bass started coming because when i first started to go out there like on the scene it was all about hype hype Give me the phone, give me the phone, me the DJ, phone. hope, 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 <laughs> right? And my MC at the early days, the early days yeah. MC was Fearless, right? Because I used to <gasps> go around and I love Fearless, yeah. Love boom, Fearless. boom, 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 selector. <laughs> <laughs> right, so that was the era for me because I remember us going Hell Scatter was all of that. Then I was, um, I might have shared this story before on the pod, but um, probably brief, but I went to Brighton where I'm living now and um I see hype hype I think hype came on and then this cat came on and me and I was with Fran and our friend Tyke and this cat come on this this white dude yeah and he done this mixing and he didn't clang he didn't clang so we're like who's this cat this cat's got something not only is he not clanging he's dropping some serious beats do you even know yeah. so when we found out his name and he's like one of the biggest legends within the drum and bass scene. He goes by the name of Andy C, the destructor, Little right? Executioner, <laughs> small but mighty. <laughs> what a guy. <laughs> that journey was like his journey, what we experienced with his journey, and um, what he's done for us. And our friends and the memories he's created for us have been some of the best memories where we've been out raving. And um, like I told you, I'll share that first one with you. Before I get onto the next kind of good memory, do you remember your first time coming across that bad man? Um, the first time seeing him live? Yeah. Or, or think- when it clicked, when it kind of said, this is the guy, this is my guy. Like, when I'm going to raise, this is the guy I want to see again. Do you know what I mean? That kind of oh, vibe. I th- obviously, I can't speak for everyone. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I know that for a lot of people, 
you feel like that after the first time you've seen him. Like yeah, that's yeah. really that's it. it. I yeah, mean, yeah. obviously he's still incredible now, but mm. I think old Andy C or young Andy C, but from mm. the older years, mm. I think there was something really like extra special then because yeah. you could go out and see him every weekend if you wanted to. I mean, him and all the big boys used to play in Watford, mm-hmm. not Watford in London, sorry, like every mm-hmm. weekend. Mm-hmm. And the lineups then used to be mad like it'd be Andy C Hype Randall yeah. Rocky SS Swift <laughs> like back, back to back to back and he, mm. like you took it for granted back then I think mm. um but yeah my first Andy C mm. experience in the flesh was probably 2000 2000 okay or maybe maybe 2001 it might, yeah I, I think that was about the same yeah yeah <laughs> maybe it was that night that we that we went to the sanctuary or one of the nights it was March 2001 and mm. I think that might have been the first time that I saw him live it was definitely the first time that I'd ever seen Marky live so that that whole night was just hold up nuts. hold up because was it Homelands? That was the first yeah. time I saw Marky. Was I think it was Homelands, and we got a photo of us, and we looking so young. <laughs> I won't even say what else we look like, but we looking <laughs> like we having a great time. Andrew Hart was there, and all of that. And I think, oh my, God. yeah, right, yeah. He'll be he'll be listening to this because yeah, the boys yeah. they they get all the YouTube wherever I'm releasing. They're just getting it in the group. Um, but we had all of that there. I think we had. Um, Roddy Barker's brother, Tom Barker. And I was just trying yes. to remember, right? Because big fans of Andy C. And uh, this new cat, which, which Ray just mentioned, called DJ Mark, he's from Brazil, Brazilian DJ. He came on and done this set, and he introduced scratching to his drum and bass set, right? Which was something you didn't get, as, you didn't get a lot of back then. Yeah, you'd normally and he just... do Andy C. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But... Andy C, because obviously you get a bit from hype. Yeah, you're right. But also, I knew that Andy C was coming on after, right? <laughs> and I was swearing for the brother. I, I got a relationship. I was worried. It was like one of those battles. Like, you know, somebody, it's like a battle rap. Somebody just dropped some serious bars. And that was going by the band of DJ Mark. And I was like, jeez, yeah. Andy, how are you going to respond to this? Yes. How did he respond? He come <laughs> out and he and dropped... He- Body rock, right? For the first time. Oh. oh if I could explain one of the most amazing moments or iconic moments I could ever say I experienced with following that guy, because that ch- that tune changed the game for it the did. style of drummer bass, didn't it? Right. It and I remember being there, really, like, what the hell is this style? Like really groundbreaking that mm. tune. I remember the first time I heard it. Mm-hmm. Um, he'd played it I think I'd gone to see him it was either at the very beginning of 2001 mm-hmm. in Fabric and he dropped it and everyone was just like what <laughs> is happening what is happening mm-hmm. and I remember when we then went to Sanctuary getting really excited when he was dropping it and I was like this is the tune this is the tune that I was telling you about but yeah it was it was weird because it kind of had a, a much slower groove to it. That swing. And like, yeah, and rather than being like most drum and bass, it was like... Yeah, that's it. That's it. Sort of like triplet sort of Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was just, it was mind-blowing. Like other people have tried to do it since then and some have succeeded and some have failed. But at the time it was just like... Look, Pendulum for me were the closest ones to get to that triplet rhythm but they're all musicians like the, the way those pendulum guys which i'll be coming on to in a bit but the way those pendulum guys were writing music then they kind of like you knew they were musicians you could tell the difference like yeah. they knew about structure um yeah. it's funny because going back to the body rock like my experience was watching how everyone knew how to dance to it straight yeah. away without being taught 
everyone changed the dancing. Everyone went into the swing naturally. Yes. And I'm just looking like, around like, like wow, <laughs> like how powerful that song was. And then the other powerful thing is, well, while Andy was dropping that, Ronnie Sides comes out from the back of the stage like, what? As if he just heard something, you know, like, who? Who? Huh? 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 <laughs> exactly, right? He come on. He Sorry. moved Andy C out the way, right? And he spammed back the tune. Right? Yeah. So rewound. The crowd was going crazy. Yeah. So the tune drops again. Good. And then yeah. MC Dynamite just comes out <laughs> from the back of the crowd, moves them both out of the way, spins it out. I've never known a tune where this threw everyone. It threw yeah. like, and there's so much love, and you can see with that whole community, everyone loved it. And I remember watching a documentary with Andy C, and he was, I think he was on the London Night, and he said, that was like one of the most, the biggest moments for him so far, because he's yeah. done so much since then. But that was one of the most iconic moments for him, was yeah. having that moment there. And it was great to know that you kind of shared that memory, especially being on that journey with him. Um, yeah. But yeah, Andy C, like, I've got to tell you another thing, guys. Ray was a big fan. And, and Andy C knew it, because Ray used to have the, the necklace with the, the label, the record label's called Ramp, right? <laughs> and she represented. She would yeah. come with a necklace, round necklace. And, and I remember we went to meet him at the front gate, yeah? And <laughs> guys, you wouldn't believe it. Imagine this for me. I was lost for words. Like, Andy was there, and I was like... <laughs> yeah. I had nothing. I had nothing. In Shameful. those days, you could... Um, you, like, the DJs would come into a club and they'd have to walk through the crowd a lot of the time with their record box, their massive, like, back-breaking record box yeah. wheeling it along behind them, or you could catch them at the front of the club or, you know, like, really special times. Like, I was yeah. talking about how like, old Andy C was different to newer Andy C, mm -hmm. but seeing him do his thing in those, like, more intimate settings, like, in the end and places like that, mm -hmm. where you're literally like almost face you're, to face you're right there properly. yeah 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 yeah, yeah. just look that's, yeah. that's beautiful because that brings us on to the point of venues because we've we've been around to a lot like as we say we toured a lot of venues we um have. we've had some iconic ones do um do you remember the one in uh what was it called which is brian g's one movement yeah do you remember of that course, one during the week bar rumba guys yeah. this one was like one of those where you, you go into one section you're just having a couple of juices and the, like the curtains or something raises and you open up yeah. to the floor. <laughs> right? Exactly, right? And it's and the thing is, it's such a small... If you look back now, I mean, when we was younger, maybe it was big, but when you... The re, re, reality of it is quite small. Yeah. And it's nice and intimate, but you got to be really close with big DJs back then. Yeah. And Bar Rumba, another thing about it, it was because it was on a Thursday and you're kind of... You're still in this early stage. Like you After you know you had the night bus, because it began on tour, but it was like a venture at that age yeah. going out. And I think yeah. about when I look at the youths now at that age, if I had youths at that age, I'd be like, boy, I'll be sweating with yeah. them going to London and what we used to get away with. And now just the thought of having to like leave a venue and get on a bus, sit on a bus for like hours to get home, not <laughs> a chance. But back then it was just like, I have to be at that rave. I'm staying at the end. So Done. yeah. What, however, I get home afterwards. I'm doing it, but yeah, now. What Jesus. would you say your one of your favorite uh, venues, like uh, you've been to or experienced in the drum and bass scene? Wow. Mm. Um. Well, well, you feel like sometimes you could be most like you're most at home because, um, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna say my one after you, just to see what you're gonna say. <laughs> well, you know me. I can never just pick one thing. There's always mm -hmm. a short list or a long mm -hmm. list. Mm -hmm. um obviously fabric is very dear to my heart i think i've been to fabric more than any other club <laughs> <laughs> um the ends which is sadly no longer there i the mean den now the den the, den. the letters around yeah <laughs> i mean God, it's back in the day jesus mm. so you could go to the end on a wednesday night for swerve yeah. Then Thursday night, if you still had the legs for it, you could go to Bar Rumba for movement. That's correct. Yeah. Then Friday, you could either be 
back at the end or fabric mm. or mm-hmm. Bagley's or mm. wherever. Bagley's, sweaty wool, sweaty wool, Bagley's, yep. Oh my God. And obviously Camden Palace as it was then, which is now Coco. Yeah, yeah. Um, Geez, I used to sometimes do an absolute mission mm-hmm. from Watford. I'd have to come get an overground from yep. where my mum lived yep. into Houston then mm-hmm. switch and go all the way back out to East to get to Stratford Rex. Rah, that I'm is a mission, guys. That's a mission. mission yeah. But my God, what a club. I remember going yeah. there with Nadia actually a couple of times. Big Nadia, what, what are you doing on Saturday? She'd be like, yeah, mm. yeah, I think I'm about. It's like, right, yeah. done. We're let's going go. to this. I've got tickets. Let's go. Mm-hmm. Um. So, yeah, I think I would probably say fabric mm-hmm. for the just it's very special and obviously for the longevity yeah. it's still going mm-hmm. it's still there and <clears throat> oh probably the end the yeah. end yeah I can definitely second that with fabric yeah for me it's a very selfish thing because we lived on the met line so to go to so to go to a rave, where you just had one train and you could just coach hard. It was like it was heaven. And at the Have beginning, you thought, for, um, snack hmm. on the way. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, it was. It was when I first when we first went to it. It was open like they didn't really search anyone when you went in. It was such a really relaxed kind of vibe there. But obviously, over the time, it just takes one one e yeah before the yeah. metal machines come in and all that but like you yeah. said it's got so much nostalgia there because we've had so many memories with different groups of friends and especially i've got a lot of memories of you with like um, casino royale dropping and then looking at your face when i with that like here's a back here's a back that right yeah. <laughs> do you know what i mean like oh, i always my- remember those memories like they look across to you you're just like looking at me like and we're like what is this moment here what were you we just experiencing and Fabric had a lot of those. And that was a really different tune at the time as well. Massively. I man. mean, because Liquid was a thing and, mm-hmm. you know, then you had the more sort of Aggie stuff. Mm-hmm. But, like, Zinc, somehow Zinc had, like, and he's still, I know he's not doing as much d yeah. these days as he was then. Mm-hmm. But he always had such a distinctive sound. Like, you'd hear a tune and you would know that it was Zinc and it was yeah. his own kind of, kind of carved out his own lane in a way mm-hmm. with the sounds that he had so yeah no yeah. well, zinc was zinc represented like zinc uh had a period where he he was underneath the label um players. hypes label two players right mm-hmm. and um then he kind of branched kind of i think it what was it i'm not sure if it was still underneath two players but he done bingo beats kind yeah, of brought in the break is, beat yeah i think him i don't know if they're mates again now but i mm. from obviously when I was friends with certain DJs back then, I think um, like true players, like the Knights themselves, the true players, Knights of Fabric used to be Height, Zinc and Pascal. And then at some point, Height and Zinc had a little bit of friction and then Zinc stopped doing the Knights. Right. The label and whatever. Right. And I didn't know this. Okay. Yeah. And that's <laughs> when he <laughs> then went off to do bingo and he was still doing drum and bass, but then he was like dabbling in garage and a bit of breakbeat. And mm-hmm. yeah, so I love Zinc. Love yeah, Zinc. man, Zinc was um, a big part because bingo beats are like, I love music and I liked it. I liked anyone which kind of ventured out and tried to do something different. And uh, Zinc did that. And he came up yeah. with some really um, iconic tracks, like the 138 track. Doom. Doom, 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 doom. That's it, right? Yeah. Come up with all of that, man. Those tunes were massive because also Garage was about, and that crossed yeah. over into Garage. So it was like a, he had a lot of style where he was, he had a good style of music that kind of crossed over. Um, and that was and, crazy. Like mm. there weren't, from what I can remember, there weren't any other DJs that were like massive in Garage and massive in DB at the same time. Like yeah. that yeah. was kind of unheard of. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think. Um, it's like like we were saying, like it's like we've had so many good memories there. But I think one of the most special ones for you mm. is um you met your husband there, right? I did at the end. Um met him there. Uh 
got engaged at the end, um, mm-hmm. which Andy C was, well, he wasn't a part of it, but we met mm-hmm. at a Ram night and then right. got engaged at a Marky night. So like my two favorite DJs <laughs> of all time probably were like kind of. And, just... look, and I remember this because when we met him, he had a buck foot in it and he was still out there still repping. There's a, Brock Foot. <laughs> there's, there's a funny story behind the Brock Foot as well. Yeah, go on, go on. Uh, we, we spoke about recently, actually. Right. So, obviously, um, it was it was really early days, like, mm. with me and him. And mm. I'd, like, packed an overnight bag. I'd gone down to London. Mm. And um, I think it was Gavin and Haggis were, like, having a joint kind of birthday thing at Fabric. So there was a whole crew of us going. I'd gone to meet Rich after work and he was like, yeah, Mm. let's let's go up to the pub for a bit. We'll go and have a few drinks. And I was like, cool. Mm. But don't forget, we've got plans tonight. You know, we've got to be there at a certain time, whatever, whatever. So we went and had our few drinks in the pub. I was like, come on, we've got to get home. Walked back to his house. So I was thinking, shower, get ready and all that. Uh-huh. Get to his house, and he's like, he's like, oh shit, I haven't got my keys. Yeah, yeah. He was living with three other people at the time. Not one of them was home. So I was like, okay. I'm meant to be meeting my mate, sir. I was fuming. So he's like, it's fine. <laughs> fine. He's like, I'm gonna climb in through the window <laughs> so we can mm. get in. So he tried to scale the little like canopy roof thing over the front mm-hmm. door. Tried to reach the window, but obviously he's not the tallest of people. Oh, no, I didn't know this. Holy so then, shit. I know. So then he's like, shit, can't get in, can't get in. So then as he's gone to jump down from the little roof pipe, it wasn't that high, <clears throat> but his foot caught the step, the little front step in front of the front door and just went, right. basically just like bent back as he's like, Oh, oh shit, my foot. And I thought mm. it was just a little minor thing. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I... <laughs> there, <you> just... <laughs> laugh. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so we ended up getting in, mm. still came to the rave. He was like, oh man, yeah, it's a little bit sore. And then the next day, like his whole leg was just like black. Damn. Uh, destroyed. So but yeah, that's a, that's <laughs> that's when you're just like, hey. Yeah, yeah, he's still he's still out there repping. He's like, that ain't gonna stop me. Ray's like, yo, this is my guy. Um, yeah. yo, bro, if you're listening, big up to you, Rich man. Bear love, brother. Hope you're good. Um, but yeah, such a special place. But my other one, mm-hmm. and you'll you'll probably get it as well, is uh, Camden Palace. Camden Palace was like a second home to me, especially when you know the characters when we had Lee Connolly come out with us. And oh my! All God. of that. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> night that i mean i've never had a bad night with you never. yeah 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 but that night was uh, just yeah, yeah such yeah. A, i i can't even really put my finger on why it was such a good night yeah like it's a combination of things you know it's just pretty yeah. much the good music we had the right crowd it's like once you're in a good space like we the thing with Camden palace so people could understand it was like it's one of those places, like, no matter how mashed up you was, you knew where you were at. And you yeah. could trust. You could walk around and feel you were totally safe. You could just yeah. chill. You, everyone's always chatting. They always, like, people be up in the toilet, have a chat in the toilet, like, yo, what's up? Yeah, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Do you know what it I mean? No matter what, even if you, you couldn't yeah. lose anyone, you know, and you can move wow. around the whole place knowing that, I mean, there's certain cats are named Perry Jones. You could always yeah. lose Perry. And I used right, to right. be the queen of, <laughs> I'm just going to the toilet for five minutes. Bye bye, Ray. Yeah, see you in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so many friends, so many of them people. It's like you're my best mate, and then you never see them again after, man. That's just yeah. that's just rave life, you know. Um, and that's what I mean. Camden Palace for me because it started when I was at my dad's. I was 16, and I was going to college, and he had two um, uh, Czechoslovakian girls there, and they oh, yeah. got, they were telling me about this. Yeah, trust me. I was a youth then. Oh, they? they were like, they were the, they were the young, uh, because they were sharing, yeah? So they were in their next room. And they were like, they, they looked at me as potential. So they took me out to Peach. 
and that was my first experience. Oh my god! And I was just I was so into Peach then. Like Peach is like was for anyone to know is like all house. And right, was it trance? Right. Was it trance? Yeah, would you say or or mix? Stuff. Yeah, and random. I got. I, do you know what? This is so good doing this with mm. you because I've got so yeah. many memories coming back. And I'm to glad. Me. Hopefully, I'm just triggering them all off because as I'm well, talking, I'm, I'm triggering.